Greetings in Jesus' name this morning. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. What a diverse crowd we have this morning. It's a wonderful blessing to be all together here, worshiping the Lord Jesus together in unity. In the spirit and in truth, we worship him this morning. <clears throat> so, you know, we, we gather together like this, and, and so oftentimes we have what we would call a time of worship before we kind of open up to other uh, topics and discussions and whatever. So I want to talk a little bit about this morning about worship and what really is worship. I'd like to hear, first of all, if there's anybody that would want to uh, maybe just shout it out, uh, what comes to your mind when you think about worship? Is there somebody that wants to just say it? What, what comes to mind when you think about worship? Gratefulness. Gratefulness. Good. Giving worth. Giving worth. Amen. Humbling ourselves before God. Sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of praise. Amen. That's a good one. It's the Psalms. So, He is Lord. Amen. That's very good. You know, oftentimes we think about worship and we think about this time that we spend together in the, this morning. And, and maybe we think about, uh, depending on where you come from and where you, you, you think about uh, maybe musical instruments and a worship team and, and maybe drums. And, or maybe you think about uh, uh, just singing together in a cappella or those kind of things. You know, those are all kind of things that we kind of attribute or we connect in our minds with worship. And it's not that... Those kind of activities cannot be a part of worship. But, you know, by themselves, uh, they are just vain things that we do if there is not a heart of worship behind it. So let's, let's go to um, the Gospel of John. And Gospel of John, chapter 4. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 21. So Jesus here, he is, this is the, the conversation with, that Jesus has with the woman at the well. And so... There's this, um, she comes to the well, and, and uh, Jesus asks her for a drink of water, and she's kind of surprised because she's a Samaritan, and, 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 uh, and uh, Jesus is a Jew, and, and not only that, but she's also a woman. And this would have been kind of out of the ordinary for a Jewish man to ask a Samaritan, even any Samaritan, but for sure, a Samaritan woman for a drink. And so she's kind of surprised by this, and then uh, he, Jesus says to her that, well, if you would ask, um, how, how did he say there? Something about that if he would, if he would, she would drink of the well, the water that he would have to offer, that she would never thirst. Anyway, it goes on to she realizes that this man is a prophet, so she has this question burning in her heart. So everybody, you know, the Jews say that, you know, this is the place to worship. The Samaritans say, this is the place to worship. So what is the real place to worship? You're a prophet. You tell me what it is. And this is, um, um, Jesus responds to that question. Verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour comes when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to be his worshipers. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him, worship in spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> and maybe we'll try to break that down here a little bit. If... Uh, you know, when you think about worshiping in the Spirit, um, maybe somebody has something they want to say. Uh, what, what do you think about worshiping in the Spirit? What does it mean to worship in the Spirit? Okay, very good, very good. Somebody else want to try? 
Speak in tongues. Okay, that can be a part of worshiping spirit. Yes. Something that comes from your heart, yes. So we often talk about, um, well, let's say, for, for, for example, we're here together this morning in this larger gathering, and, and you know, we're here to worship the Lord, we're here to hear some, uh, uh, the word of the Lord come forth, and, and uh, you know, we're here to be a blessing, to be together in unity and oneness. But we might ask the question, so what was the spirit of the meeting? You know, even though we are getting together to be together in unity and oneness and whatever, somebody might come and leave here and say, boy, that, uh, there was a, there's a spirit of hypocrisy in that place. What do they mean by that? Well, yes. But it basically means that maybe we are here doing a form of worshiping the Lord, but in reality, there was... What was really real that was coming out was hypocrisy. That doesn't always mean that everything everybody feels is always the truth, but that's the idea of what is meant when somebody says that, you know, that person has kind of a spirit of condemnation about him. Or, you know, even though, or that meeting, there was, a, well, there was a spirit of oppression in that place. Or some of those kind of terms is what we hear. And it really means that no matter what was the meaning or the purpose of gathering together, what was really coming out from the heart and the depth of what was there was oppression. So the same thing is true when we look at something that is positive. When we think about worshiping in the spirit, there's a spirit of worship here. It means that no matter what, what it was that you were really getting together for, what was really coming out was a spirit of worship. Worshiping in the spirit and the truth. Brother said that something that's coming from the heart, something that's coming from the very depth of who you are. It's not just on the surface. It's not just something that's an outward form of what you're doing. It's coming from the very depth of who you are. That's worshiping in the spirit. Without hypocrisy. You know, we might come together to worship here. Yeah, let's talk about maybe individuals. Maybe I had an argument with my wife on my way. Now I come and I act like everything's okay and I'm raising my hands in, in the meeting and I'm worshiping and, and... Or am I really worshiping? Do I, am I worshiping in the spirit, I should say? No, that's right. What's really coming from my heart is contention, not worship. That's what it means to worship in the spirit. Then we ask, okay, so what does it mean to worship in truth? Maybe somebody wants to try that one. What does it mean to worship in truth? Righteousness. Righteousness. What, what, maybe we should also ask the contrary wise, what does it mean to, what, what is false worship? Putting on a show. That could be it, but that could also fall in the same category as what we were talking before about worshiping the spirit. <clears throat> I think when I look at that, I think, about, so what is truth? God is truth. People worship all kinds of different things, false gods. Maybe they worship their things. Maybe they're uh, uh, a celebrity or there's all kinds of things that people worship. And when you think, really think about what, does, what is worship, what does worship mean? Somebody said something about put it, giving worth to something. <clears throat> The word worship in the Old Testament, the same word is also in some places, many places actually, uh, translated as bowing down. Bowing down to something. Humbling yourself before something. And so people bow down to many different gods that they have. In our day and age, you know, we have a lot of people worshiping celebrities and, and movie stars and things like that. Is that worshiping in the truth? Are they giving worth to something that really has worth? So if you're giving worth to something that doesn't really have any worth, it's not worshiping in the, tru in the truth. So if you're going to worship in the spirit and in truth, you might be able to worship in spirit and yet not in truth. Or you might be able to worship, the other, worship something that truth but not really worshiping in spirit. 
But to worship in spirit and in truth is to worship is worship that comes from the depth of your heart, from the very heart of who you are, to something that really has worth. Worshiping in spirit and in truth. So are we worshiping in spirit and in truth this morning? Are your hearts clear? Is the worship that you were offering this morning, is it something that comes from the depth of your heart? <clears throat> Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. This is where the word worship first appears in the Bible. Genesis chapter 22. And verse 5. So this is where the, the, where the word worship first appears in the Bible. It says, it's the context of Abraham taking his son out to offer him up as a burnt offering. So God, after so many years where Abraham waited for this promised son, and then finally he has the promised son, and then one day God says, all right, now I want, to, want, to, want you to take him out and to offer him up as a burnt offering. And it says that Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he took his servants and his <clears throat> donkey and he, his son, and he started out to the place where God had showed him. <clears throat> then he comes to goes three days travel and he comes to the place where he can see the mountain where he's supposed to offer up his son and he says verse 5 Abram said to his young men stay here with the donkey the boy and I will go over there and we will worship and come back to you <clears throat> we will worship and come back to you Okay, well, I thought he was going to go out there and he was going to burn his, uh, t offer up his son as a burnt offering. And now he's saying we're going to go out there to worship. <clears throat> it's a very, very real part of what really true worship is, is to give that which is valuable to you in an offering to him that is worthy. So here, God is asking Abraham to offer up that which was most precious to him, this promised son that he had waited for, what was it, 25 years that he had waited for him? And finally he had this promise. And then he says, I and a son, we're going over there to worship, and then we, 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 will, be, we will come back to you. So there's a couple things in there. First of all, he's giving that which was most precious to him, offering up to the Lord. And he also see, you also see there that he recognized that God was not going to forget his promise, that he was going to have his son back again. <clears throat> so that's worship. When you take that which is valuable and you offer it up to God who is worthy, <clears throat> so that goes far beyond just uh, half an hour of singing and offering up praises to the Lord, even though I feel like, I, I, I believe that that is a very vital, very uh, um, very um, crucial part of worship, you could say, is singing and offering praise, a sacrifice of praise, it says in Psalms 1 place. But is it just something that's, is it something that's coming from deep within your heart? How much are you willing to sacrifice in your worship? What are you willing to give up in your worship to the Lord? <clears throat> Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 15. So here, the Pharisees are challenging Jesus. 
saying in verse 2, Why do you disciples disobey the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered them, Why do you also disobey the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of a father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever shall tell his father and his mother whatever help you might otherwise have gotten from me is a gift devoted to God. He is not to honor his father or his mother. You have made the word of God void because of your tradition. You hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you. These people honor me with their lips, but with their hearts, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they do worship me, teaching instructions that are the commandments of humans. So here you have <clears throat> the, the, the one part there is, I don't think I'm going to go into the whole dynamics of the, of the illustration he gives there, but the idea there in verse 8, these people honoring me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So basically they're offering up praises to the Lord with their mouth and maybe raising their hands in the meeting, but their hearts are far from it. In this example, he gives something of where, where they're, because of their selfishness, they're not willing to give up they're not willing to obey God and honor their father and mother because they would that which they should have used to provide for their parents, they put away as an offering to God, but really they were keeping it for themselves. And there's a whole, you know, <clears throat> description of that that you could go into. I don't know if I'm going, going into that right now, but just the idea of honoring with their lips, but their heart is far from me. <clears throat> so whether we worship the Lord, or let's put it this way, our worship unto the Lord does not start at 9.30 this morning. It's not something that when we come here, we spend half an hour worshiping the Lord, and then we go on to other things. You know, worship is a lifestyle. And we, as God's people, offer up our life as a worship to the Lord. We just, just talked about uh, Abraham offering up his son Isaac. Now we could go to... Uh, Romans chapter 12, there it gives uh, what God is asking us to offer up to him. <clears throat> Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. So he's saying here, uh, the King James Version says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is just your reasonable service. It's just reasonable. God is not asking something unreasonable here. He's just, it's just your reasonable service, considering all that he has done for you. <clears throat> Offering up our bodies, a living sacrifice, giving ourselves, our lives as a service to the Lord, that is worship. And that is something that we do every day. If that worship is truly coming from the heart, if we are really worshiping in the spirit, that is something that comes from the depths of who we are every day, wherever we go. <clears throat> wherever we find ourselves, offering ourselves up a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. A living sacrifice. You know, we often think about, when we think about sacrifice, is something that we, you know, in the Old Testament, it was something that they killed and burned up in the altar. That was a sacrifice. We are a living sacrifice. We are given to God every day, giving our bodies, our lives, to His service. There's also examples in the Old Testament. You know, one of the things that uh, comes across several times in the Old Testament where God reproves his, his people for not worshiping in the Spirit and in truth. One of those places is Isaiah chapter 1. 
You can turn there with me if you want. Isaiah chapter 1, God is reproving his people. <clears throat> so I'm going to start in verse 10. There's a lot of other things there, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to drop right down to verse 10. And he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our, of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed animals. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of male goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is abomination to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I can't bear with evil assemblies. My soul hates your new moons and your appointed feasts. They are a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, when you make my, many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So here, you read through that and you say, now wait a minute, isn't this the very things that God had appointed for them to do? Offering up uh, uh, offerings and sacrifices and their new moons and their feasts and their... Uh, all these things, you know, that they were ordered to do, their Sabbath and all these things. Wait a minute. So why, what is going on here? Why is he saying that I hate these things when you are the very, when God himself had set these in order? <clears throat> and then he goes on down. Verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourself clean, put away the evil of your doings from before your eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do well. And he says these words. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, the sword shall devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So when we uh, consider what is true worship, what is worshiping in the spirit and in truth, we have to consider what is the heart of the God that we worship. And this is one of the things that God repeats different times in, uh, through his prophets, prophets in different places. When you see the list that he gives were the things that they were leaving out and it was, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. These are the things that are very close to God's heart. And you see that throughout the scripture in many different places that it comes out where God cares about those who are oppressed. He cares about those who are maybe not able to help themselves or those who are Cast, cast aside those who are weak. He cares about oppression. He cares about those things. And he really desires for us to know his heart in these matters. And like Abraham, when we truly worship God in the spirit and in truth, those things that are near and dear to God's heart will become near and dear to our heart. And we will be willing to sacrifice in order to fulfill God's purpose in our life. Another place where that shows up is, is uh, uh, Matthew 23, 23. Maybe I can just quote that. <clears throat> so in Matthew 23, 23, this is the chapter where Jesus over and over again speaks out woe over the scribes and the Pharisees. And here he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, ye hypocrites, <clears throat> for ye tithe mint and anise and cumin, but ye leave the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. So they're all concerned about these little external things, tithing just the right amount of all their spices and their things that they grow in their fields and whatever, making sure that they get just the right amount. But Jesus says, you have left the weightier matters of the law. In other words, the more important things you are not doing, judgment, mercy, and faith. And this 
flows right in line with what he's saying here in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 1 as well, where he talks about seek justice, relieve the press, judge the fatherless. Judgment, mercy, and faith. What is judgment when we think about what judgment is? He, here he even talks about to judge the fatherless. And we often think about judge, judging as in a negative sense. And there is certainly a negative side of, of judgment to where when, when somebody is judged, there's usually two sides of it. There's uh, maybe somebody, um, if I steal something from Merle, then it is brought before the judge and it is determined that, yes, in fact, I did steal something from Merle. So I need to give back and maybe give back more according to Scripture. So in that case, there is a judgment is made. Merle is judged. I am judged. I need to make right what I have wrong. And Merle receives justice for what he has been wrong. So there's two sides of judgment. <clears throat> in this case, you know, we talk about justice or... Um, um, Judgment, mercy, and faith. I think I have those words right. Anyway, so he's talking about equity. Talking about making right that which is wrong. Or maybe helping out those which have been wronged. <clears throat> there's, <clears throat> there's another passage in Isaiah that I want to go to. Isaiah chapter 58. Gives you the same some of the same wording. So here he's talking about fasting and <clears throat> maybe I'll just start in verse 1 there. I'm not quite sure where the right place to break in. Cry aloud, do not spare. Lift up your voices like a trumpet and declare to my people their disobedience and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. And delight to know my ways as a nation that did unrighteousness, that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted, say they, and, why, and you do not see? Why have we afflicted our soul and you take no knowledge? Look, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Look, you fast for strife and contention and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You do not fast this day so as to make your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast that I have chosen, a day, the day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a rush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? So there again, God is asking his people, he says, <clears throat> so they're fasting and they're, they're seeking God. And, and God is saying, is, is this really what I want for a day for you to, you know, go without food or water or or, you know, to afflict your souls. Or, is that really what I'm asking for? I mean, is that really a right fast? And at the same time, you're, you're, uh, <clears throat> you're finding pleasure and you're exacting all your labors and, you know, you're making sure that you get paid all the right amounts and you're, you're caring for yourself and whatever. Is that the kind of fast I'm looking for? <clears throat> Again, think about fasting. There's many examples in Scripture about fasting. I believe in fasting. I encourage you to fast. And it's not that he's speaking out here that we should not fast. But there was something else that was wrong in their fasting. So then he says, verse 6, Isn't this the fast that I have chosen? To release the bonds of wickedness, to undo bands of, the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Isn't it to distribute your bread to the hungry? And that you bring the poor who are cast out to your house. When you see the naked, that you cover him. And that you not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth as the morning. And your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your, your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking wickedly, and you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall rise in darkness and your obscurity be as the noonday. 
And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in dry places and make strong your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. <clears throat> so here he's basically saying again, because in the midst of your fast, you're not letting go of those who are oppressed. You're not caring for the poor and the needy. <clears throat> Isn't this the fast that I have chosen for, do, for you to, to, to feed the hungry, to give your bread to, distribute your bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor who are cast out to your house? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. Again, he's wanting us to make a real sacrifice, give of ourselves for something that he really cares about, the poor and the needy, the hungry, those who are cast out, those who are oppressed. Feed them, bring them to your house, give them clothes, care for them. <clears throat> and then, James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks of himself to be religious, why he does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this man's religious is worthless. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. By the world. Again, similar words. And you see this, over, this, this pattern over and over throughout Scripture. There's a lot of other places that I could go to to, to show this same pattern where God really cares about the, the oppressed and the fatherless, the widows, those who are cast out, those who are oppressed, those who do not have the basic needs of life. And for us to really, truly worship God is to offer up of ourself, of our own to God for those things that God really cares about or those things that are very close and near and dear to God's heart. <clears throat> I think I'm going to end with that. Blessings to you all. <clears throat> May we... Let's just pray. Our God and Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the God of all comfort, blessed Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Lord, I just pray that you would work in our hearts this morning. Just press these realities deep where they take root, where they can grow, <clears throat> where this word, your word, get a hold of our very being, grip us, Father, that we would be moved to action by our worship, that we would take seriously those things that are near and dear to you heart, your heart, and that we would long to see the oppressed go free. Fathers, as we just uh, think about what our brother John shared this morning too, I just pray, Lord, there is so many different areas where we could go to where there's so much oppression and there's so much bloodshed, there's so much that we could throw our hearts into, Lord. Oh, Father, I just pray that you would give each one of us a vision, a purpose in life, a place to pour out their soul to you, a place to make a complete sacrifice, giving our lives to the one who is worthy, the one who has redeemed us, the one who has given his son, his all for us. Thank you for your presence, O oh God. Don't pass us by today, O oh Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Work among us. In Jesus' name, amen.